Over the years, um, I've spoken out about the refusal of feminists to look at their own failings. I've spoken out about women's studies, uh, which, to, for me, uh, it's led to the ghettoisation of women's issues. I've spoken out about identity politics, which has fractured the left, leaving it with the paucity of ideas and, more often than not, on the defensive, never setting the agenda, letting Rush Limbaugh set the agenda. It's a bad idea. I've spoken out about postmodern theory, which put a premium on, which didn't put a premium premium on distinguishing good writing from bad, and encouraged the belief in three generations of students that objectivity is a fool's errand. Uh, telling truth from lies, as far as I'm concerned, that's a fundamental human endeavour. Give that, give up on that one, and we're lost. Now, I'm hardly the first person to object to postmodern theory. But back when I was speaking up about it, so many of my old mates from university embraced it with such fervency that to question it at that time really, really did put me beyond the pale. I've also spoken up a lot, and I've been doing it probably a bit this trip, about the Australian arts grant system, which was established with the best of intentions, small population, writers, artists, filmmakers, you know, they all needed encouragement. And now it's just a trough. Also, people receiving grants um, began, have begun not only to expect them, indeed demand them as their right, but they've also equated their talent with the grants they receive. And in that same territory, I've spoken up about writing schools, which produce fiction which is narrow in scope. Writers go to writing school and then teach in them. Write about, um, there's the old maxim, write about what you know, and I've said this, I think, probably here before, you should get out in the world and write about what you know. Uh, it has also occurred to me that we have a preponderance of historical novels in Australia because it's easier to write about convicts than it is to write about bankers. You might actually have to go out and get to know a few bankers. Convicts you can imagine and you can read their diaries, but um, bankers? Hmm. Actually, bankers, I've had lots of thoughts on bankers because I worked on Wall Street for a time. Uh, the main thought on bankers is that banking needs to be rethought because of computers. Volume and speed. Risk can't even begin to be controlled. And as well, rumour... Um, computers amplify rumour and gossip. And as we all know, markets are emotional. All of these um, things that I've just brought up they're in the book, and I hope I argue them with more nuance than I have here. Now, the cost of all this is indeed that you know, I've been, actually have been sidelined and ignored. Um, with this book, it's been rather marvellous because a lot of people have been coming out and saying, goodness me, I didn't know you wrote. You were so versatile, actually, <laughs> that you've written about so many things. Um, also, a lot of women have been coming up to me, and uh, the book reminds them of their lives, and they talk about themselves and what they've gone through, and, and that's rather <laughs> terrific. Um, but I, I actually had to think hard. I was um, I was ignored mainly, I suppose, as you could see from my list, um, by the crusty old sisterhood. You're still not hearing me? You're still having trouble? Um, it used to bother me being ignored, ignored but it doesn't anymore. Um, and, and then the question comes up, was I, this leads into what Shelley was saying, was I sidelined and ignored deliberately? And it's occurred to me that perhaps not. Um, when I come back to Australia, I've often had the sensation that the words coming out of my mouth couldn't actually be heard. <laughs> um, there's a psychological phenomenon called cultural blindness, and it's, um, psychologists did an experiment and they dropped a gorilla amongst a group of people, and I'm simplifying here, and they couldn't see the gorilla because they didn't expect one to be there in the middle of the street. And then there's the old and probably apocryphal story of the Pacific Islanders who physically couldn't see a ship with big white sails that had anchored in their harbour because such a vessel didn't exist in their world. And then similarly, I think over the years, you know, I've lived in New York, New York for a very, very long time, the issues I, I was bringing up, it just wasn't part of the intellectual debate in Australia and thus couldn't be heard. This is, and this is not a valued judgment. Every culture has different preoccupations. 
Anyway, I'm giving them the benefit of the doubt there. As well, with age, one gains a little bit of self-knowledge, one hopes. Um, I'm an outlier, I'm a contrarian by preference and personality, and I am over to the side, over to the edge, and that's where actually where I want to be. Um, one thing that's always puzzled me about many Australian expat writers, they want your approval. And Germaine and Peter Carey, and they all come back here, Bob Hughes, they want you to like them. And they come back and they say things that are just mightily condescending. And then they get upset when you don't like them. And this has actually fascinated me because actually I really and truly, and don't take this the wrong way, I actually don't care what you think of me. (laughs) Um, I avoid reading bad reviews. I mean, that comes with age. You don't want to chew on those. Actually, as you grow older, it's not... You you really want... You don't want... You want an intelligent review. You don't mind whether the book is praised or panned, so long as it's an intelligent review. Um, But actually, this... um, I've been thinking a lot about this trip. Um, This not caring bit about, you don't... I don't need you to care what I say or what I do. Um, And actually, it goes back to my husband's Alzheimer's. It changed me completely. It cauterised me, and it boiled me clean of need, and I don't know if anybody's gone through Alzheimer's and seen somebody with a very large mind lose all of it. Um, when life comes you at, you at you full on, you sometimes get cauterized, and I'm sure quite a few of you know this. So when it comes down to, you know, I'm happy so long as I have a roof over my head, friends who bring out the best in me, a mystery to read or a movie to watch, a novel or an essay on the go, and I'm happy. That's it. Well, I'm kind of pleased when bankers act up. They're the gift that keeps on giving, and I can talk about them. (laughs) My life in New York City, it really suits me. It's private, it's anonymous, and no one judges me. I've had enough of ideologies, of isms, to last several lifetimes. I have enough of closed minds, I've had enough of intellectual dishonesty and false modesty. Um, Shelley and I have talked a bit about George Orwell. I'm probably an Orwellian socialist, you know, capitalism, a bit of a safety net, few regulations. <laughs> I'm also a humanist. I had a very bizarre thing happen once. An old university, university mate was teaching in the... There's a, Wagga, a university at Wagga. I was visiting my dad. Thank God there wasn't a university at Wagga when I went to... Well, I, I, I would have had to go there and not come to Sydney. <laughs> So off I went to Wagga and I gave a little talk and this guy stood up and he started to deconstruct humanism. And it was really strange to be standing there next to this, next to this man saying that humanism meant nothing. Patriarchal structure, blah, blah, blah. It actually went right over the heads of everybody in the audience, but it was a complete diss of me. But anyway, uh, I say in trouble that I'm even more radical now than when I was in 1970, which if you read that first speech is probably saying something. But actually, now I know what I speak. Stick out my neck? Well, maybe, why not? Incorrigible. While I was writing this, I was listening. I actually love country music, and I was listening to an uh, Australian country music singer, Casey Chambers, and the line went, I've got something to say, and I thought it might be worth a mention. If you're not pissed off at the world, you're just not paying attention. <laughs> <laughs> I, was asked, I was doing an interview with James Valentine on the ABC, and uh, he asked me, it's, if it's actually possible these days to make a stand or be a radical, what with all the blogs? You know, so much jabbering, so much noise out there, everybody's saying everything. Everyone's got an opinion. Is it possible to stick your head above the parapet, he asked. I mean, basically, is there a parapet these days? And later in the week, James and my brother and I, we did a discussion on, a, well, it makes sense, on creative entrepreneurship. Um, my brother is an entrepreneur, creative entrepreneur, and writers, in a sense, are entrepreneurs, white page every day, etc., etc. And our dad being a farmer, another form of entrepreneurship. And, uh, and James was there because I thought it was probably a good idea to put somebody between my brother and me. But um, anyway, it worked out very well. But on the way home, I mean, during the discussion, of course, I banged on about the grant system and what it had done to Australian creativity. 
and uh, as is my want. Uh, actually, my brother has a version of this, and what he says is that everybody should be put on clipper ships and be made to sail the China Sea, so to speak. Yeah. Anyway, on the way home, I could hear the two of them talking in the front seat, and they were cackling away, and asked them what was the joke, and they said, Kathy, you keep, keep saying things that are illegal. <laughs> you are not supposed to. Have a go at the grand system. It was so easy at the beginning in 1970 to say and do illegal things. Wear a dress when your feminist sisters were wearing overalls. That was enough to put everybody in a lather. Actually, I was interviewed uh, a week or so ago by a young gal in Melbourne, and the first thing out of her mouth was, so glad you're not using Botox. (laughs) (laughs) And then she said, your clothes. You know, you can't be a radical wearing those clothes. Mon Pont jacket. <laughs> actually, I think it was uh, Calvin Klein collection that day. Anyway, so I had to point out to her, actually, I live in New York, shopping a sport, never pay retail. I also had to point out that it's not the clothes that make somebody radical. It's the ideas. And in fact, the most radical man in America at the moment is Paul Volcker, who actually put the words purity and banking reform in the same sentence. It's truly (laughs) radical. So I didn't know I would have to delve into my past, and I think at the beginning of this, I I used a quote from my good friend Les Murray, who's another one who gets into trouble all the time. Um, I've seen a few friends this visit around, and I'm absolutely distressed at what Australians do to people who actually do have opinions that run counter, um, Les being one of them, Shelley being another, Chris Koch. Um, <laughs> it's okay for me in New York to do and say what I do, but to live here, I think I would go absolutely balmy. And I say that in all seriousness. The quote in front of the book um, from Les is, how lovely and terrible and lonely is this? Seemed to sum up my life. And... Um, One last thing. I think by the time I got to the end of the book, I didn't know whether it would work. I never know whether my book's going to work uh, until um, they're sent off. And um, I think it did work. And uh, I think what I was trying to say, I realised by the time I got to the end, was um, keep an open mind and an open heart. And... This is talking to me. <laughs> it sounds like the uh, races or a football game. No, I think it's Peter Carey listening, isn't it? <laughs> Damn the man. <laughs> um, I have a friend who is... Uh, I've just got to find this. He's a, he, a, a banking friend. He's um, in, in corporate communications. He worked at Merrill Lynch. He went to... Citicorp, then he went to UBS, uh, then he went to Bank of Scotland, and now he's out of a job. Fabulous guy. And uh, he has a, a face like a Roman coin, and it's because he, he's a Vlack. I don't know, are there any Vlacks here? They're a group of Italians that went over into the mountains of Macedonia in the, around about the 14th century, and they've been up in their mountain fastnesses for a very long time with their own language. It's a Romance language. Uh, the Bulgaris, the... Um, the jewellery people are flax. And he gave me this wonderful, um, wonderful quote. I can't give you the vlack quote, um, but the translation goes like this. I knew a tale, I told a tale. How well I don't know, but I have not deceived you. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs>